the church into false doctrine. And you listen to me, every one of you prosperity preachers. Jesus Christ did not die on a cross. He did not take the stripes on his back. He did not take a crown on his head. His side was not pierced that we may drive Rolls Royces and buy $12,000 dogs and live in $40 million homes, but he died on a cross to save mankind from the power of sin and the grip of darkness and shame on you, shame on you, shame on you. Man's problem is not what kind of suit he wears or what kind of house he lives in or what kind of house he dri- or car he drives. Man's problem is sin and man needs a savior and that savior is Jesus Christ. There must be a reformation of the cross. There must be a reformation of the cross. You're not getting it. I said there must be a reformation of the cross. The church must come back. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The church must have a reformation of Christ and him crucified. I'm angry, I'm mad, I'm tired of God's people being fleeced. We, listen, you better hang on and buckle your seatbelts. We don't need any more prosperity pimps leading the church into spiritual idolatry. said we don't need any more prosperity pimps leading the church down a primrose path of destruction we don't need any more snake oil salesmen we need men of God who will stand behind a pulpit and preach the gospel I'm going to say it again. If you're preaching that lie of the dream, you are a prosperity pimp. I said, if your gospel is the gospel of greed, you're a prosperity pimp. And you're going to stand before God and give an account for every single message that you preached on that. Souls are dying and going to hell and you're prostituting the word of God. Men are bound by alcohol and you're prostituting the word of God. Homosexuals bound and dying in their sin and you're prostituting the gospel of Jesus Christ. Prosperity pimps. Let me tell you what's going on. And let me tell you what's going to happen. Jesus said, when he walked into the temple, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. You are thieves. And I remind you what happened. He cleaned the place out. And he's going to clean the place out again. Your day is numbered. Your day is numbered. Your day is numbered. He's about ready to turn over those tables. He's about ready to throw you out. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Where people can get saved, not have success seminars. I'm sick and tired of preachers 
saying, we don't want Kmart Christians in this church. They, won't, they don't want you, but Jesus wants you. I don't care if you ain't got shoes on your feet. Jesus wants you. I don't care if you ain't got two dimes for your head. Jesus wants you. I don't care if you don't know where your next meal is coming from. Jesus wants you. Where tonight are the preachers that will stand up and take a stand? Where are they? We need Jeremiah's. We need some Daniel's. We need some Isaiah's. We need some Jehoshaphat's. We need some David's. We need some Hezekiah's that says, I'm sick and tired of a dirty temple. It's time to clean it up. It's amazing. They say, give, give, give. And Jesus says, gave. You don't get it. They're telling you to give, and Jesus has already gave. Listen. The modern day greed gospel is nothing more than a Ponzi scheme. It's nothing more than you walking into a casino, dropping your coin in, and pulling the slot machine. Listen, when a preacher stands up and says, if you write a check for $1,000, your mortgage will be paid off and all your debt canceled, that's a lie. And somebody needs to get mad and say so. When a preacher tells you that if you will give so much that God has to give you so much in return, that's a lie. When a preacher stands up and says the blessing of Abraham is wealth, that is a lie. The blessing of Abraham is justification by faith. The Bible says, and Abraham, but he cut him out under Abraham. Abraham believed God and God accounted it unto him for righteousness. When a preacher stands up and says Jesus was a billionaire wearing designer clothes, that is a lie. When a preacher stands up and says your healing is based on how much you give, that is is a lie. The Bible says, freely given, freely received. When God healed me of migraine headaches, when the doctor couldn't, Jesus didn't say, give me a thousand dollars and I'll think about it. He said, up with my stripes, you are healed. Now, Jesus does prosper. We believe in prosperity. And I will tell you what that prosperity is in a minute. The body of Christ is not a commodity or an article of commerce to be looted by a gospel of greed for preachers to make merchandise of him. When I stand before God, I'm going to have to answer the question, did I manipulate the people or did I preach the word? And this greed gospel is nothing more than manipulation. 
One preacher the other day walked up, held up his hands, talking about this diamond ring costs 40000 This diamond ring costs 70000 That is an abomination in the eyes of God. Let me tell you, you preachers are going to give an account for your $12,000 dogs and your Rolls Royces. <laughs> we are selling Jesus. We are selling the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. We are selling Jesus Christ. The one who bore the stripes upon his back. Who took our punishment that we deserved. We are selling him at bargain basement prices. Now let's look at what Paul said. I've made half the world mad now. The Apostle Paul said this in verse 5. He used the word destitute. That word means that through selfish desires, they had departed from the truth. They were those who once knew the truth. They knew the message. But they turned their back from it. And the reason why they did it, because they believed that godliness was a means to financial gain. In other words, these prosperity pimps make religion a means of livelihood. They make their livelihood off of your hard sweat and labor. Oh, you didn't get it. Have you ever noticed the only ones driving the Rolls Royces are them and not you? Now, 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 now I, I believe a minister should be blessed because ministry is the hardest work in the world. Because what we say... The other day I saw a, a fundraising letter for one of the biggest names in, God, in, in, in Christian te television. And it was the most abomination thing I've ever seen. A picture of a hand. Put your hand on this. Take your offering to the bottom of the hand. And claim your victory. And at the bottom of it was a seed, a little seed. Now take this seed and plant it, and that's going to represent your harvest. That's a lie. That's manipulation. When the preacher writes, God put you on my heart last night, never mind he's writing to 300,000 people. And he doesn't even know who you are. He doesn't even know where you exist. Wake up, church. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. It is a gimmick. And let me tell you, the church and those preachers, they're worse than the secular world when it comes to their marketing promotions. I, I was sitting in a Christian television station Fourteen years ago. A station that would not allow us to be on. And I, I don't know why the guy invited me to be there. And I wish I hadn't have gone. I had to repent afterwards. I looked at the monitor at the program that was running at that time. And the man was saying, I have in my hand a bottle of holy water from Israel. Send me a hundred dollars. Smear this oil over your body, your house, your car, and your pocketbook, and God will bless you. Now listen. They would let that on 
but they would not let us on to preach salvation. He said, man of God, flee these things. And you know what the word flee means? Run! Run! Don't talk about it, don't think about it, but kick it into high gear and run from it because it will lead to your destruction. And he said, flee these things and follow after righteousness. Now let me tell you what prosperity is. Prosperity is godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. That's the prosperity that the gospel of Jesus Christ brings. Singers, come back. Musicians, come back, please. As I was preparing this message, and I'm not exaggerating, I was sitting at my desk. And the Spirit of the Lord came on me, and, it, and I, I actually got up and went and closed my door. And I sat at my desk and I laid my head down. And I began to weep. And I said, Lord, do you really want me to say this? And I said, Lord, how do you give an altar call? After a message like this. And the Spirit of the Lord came on me. He took me back to these past 14 years. And at times during that time, and I'm, 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 I don't want your sympathy, and I'm not exaggerating, but I thought I'd lose my mind. And all I had was my family and Jesus. But I like what Martin Luther King said. He said, God plus you is a majority. This is what the Lord told me and how to close this service. He brought back a story in the early 1930s. A young man who was the son of a minister was born with a gift and a talent to sing his name was George Beverly Shea as he grew into adulthood he began to sing on radio and one day a talent scout heard him and asked him if he would like to have a tryout to sing on the biggest radio program in that area that covered and back in those days there were so few radio stations that a hundred thousand radio hundred thousand watt radio station would go for miles he tried out for them they laid a contract on the table offering to pay him more money than he'd ever could imagine but it was to sing secular songs he said I can't give you an answer right now and he went laid before the Lord came back a few days later and said no I can't do it but out of that experience came a song that's my testimony. <laughs> Tabitha, please. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I would rather be his than have a Tis 
and tied around her. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee. Because thou sufferest, and the word sufferest there means allow. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, which call her, calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now listen to me very quickly. All false doctrine is to seduce the children of, of God into spiritual fornication, spiritual adultery. All false doctrine and false apostles and prophets. Three churches that God spoke about. Three that had the same teaching, the same foundation. Three that had the same problems. False prophets and false doctrine. One church he commended, two churches he rebuked. I think that gives us an idea what the Holy Spirit has to say about false apostles and false prophets. I want to deal tonight primarily not with false doctrine per se. I want to deal with the preachers and the churches who know better but say nothing. And I want to minister tonight on the subject, a conspiracy of silence. I submit that most false doctrine would fall flat on its face without a recognizable name or voice behind it. Therefore, I submit that the voice is more dangerous than what's being taught. Because what's being taught gives it authenticity and authority. Let me, let me prove my point. Every one of you, if someone walked up and gave you a track that did not have the Arthur's name anywhere on it, that did not have the ministry that was behind its name on it. It was unencumbered by authorship. And you as a born-again, spirit-filled believer picked it up and read, and if you read this, Jesus went into hell to free mankind from the penalty of Adam's high treason. When His blood poured out, it did not atone. Jesus spent three horrible days and nights in the bowels of this earth getting back for you and me our rights with God. He went to hell, now listen very carefully. He went to hell a demon-possessed mortal man. And emerged from hell a born-again resurrected man. This born-again Jesus then defeated Satan and his forces of darkness in hell. It is important for us to realize that a born-again man defeated Satan. Every single one of you, if someone handed you that and you read that, you would wad it up and throw it away. But when you read the same... And I'm going to read part of it again. He went to hell, a demon-possessed mortal man, writes Kenneth Copeland. The moment the name is put with it, the idea comes to mind, he's on television all over the world. He is a quote-unquote man of God. He knows more about the Bible than I do. He must have some knowledge of something that I don't know. Therefore, there must be some truth to it or he would not say this. Now let me help you here. 
I've got nothing personal against Brother Copeland. This is not a personal issue. It is a spiritual issue. I've got nothing against my son. I love him with all of my heart. But if he gets off track, I'm going to pull him off to the side and I'm going to try to bring correction. So it's not a personality contest. It's not I'm jealous of his ministry or he's jealous of my ministry or I've got a bone to pick from him. No, no, no. What's at stake? What's at stake? What's at stake is the truth of why Jesus Christ came to this earth. And I don't care if they brand me. I don't care if they want to tar and feather me. I don't care if they snicker at me and make fun. Jesus Christ did not become a demon-possessed mortal man on the cross. That is blasphemy. You're not hearing me. That is blasphemy. That comes from the pit of hell. Jesus Christ was the only pure man that ever lived this and walked on this earth. And on the cross, He did not become a sinner. He did not become demon-possessed. But He became the sin-bearer. He that knew no sin became a sin offering that we might become the righteousness of God. You could not be saved tonight coming to a demon-possessed Jesus. You could not be saved. You could not be healed. You could not be redeemed. You could not be justified. And Dad said it every service. What greater attack of Satan and more subtle than to get the eyes off of the church, off of who Jesus is and what He did. Now, let me help you. Why do they have to teach that? Because it goes right into their next teaching. That we all become gods. That we are the incarnation of God. That we are little Jesuses. Let me read something else to you. Once again, without identifying, you'd reject it. In the new birth... God imparts His very nature, substance, and being into our human spirits. Hence, every born-again man becomes an incarnation. And that the believer is much an incarnation as Jesus of Nazareth. Lest... Then He says, that's who we are. We're Christ. Now listen to me. That's who we are. We're Christ. And I'm going to pause for a minute. I love you. But you ain't Jesus. Amen. And God knows, look at me. Five, seven, a belly hanging over. I got to keep my belt tight. My knee is killing me. Like my back is hurting. I ain't no Jesus. He says then, in fact, in the epistles, the church is called Christ. The church has not yet realized, he writes, we're Christ. When we do realize we're Christ, we'll start doing the work we're supposed to do. Christ is the head, we are the body, and the body of Christ is Christ. Now I want to help you. That's really Hinduism. Who teaches that ultimately all men become gods. Now, if you read that, you have enough sense to recognize that we're not the incarnation of Jesus of Nazareth. Am I right? But when you read that, and at the end of it, you find, so states Kenneth Hagin, then it takes on an entirely different light. Well, he's got so much more experience. Once again, it's not a personality thing. It is standing up for truth. In my text, I'm coming down to the close very quickly, and I'm going to give you some scriptures on its right to judge. Three churches in that second chapter. All three had the same foundation. 
Christ. All three had learned from the same men. All three had the same gospel. And all three had the same problems. As every church has false apostles bringing in false doctrine. Now I want you to notice in the Ephesus church notice what Jesus said. He first of all complimented them and commended them because they identified the bearer of the false prophecies. You have identified these false apostles. Then the church at Ephesus tried them by the word. Which simply means they put the word up against what they were teaching. And it didn't match. Let me help you. I don't care if there's 20,000 people there. I don't care if they're saying people are walking out of wheelchairs and blinded eyes are being open. If what they preach and teach does not match up with the Word of God, it is not of God. It is not of God. And when is the church going to recognize miracles are not to prove that something is of God. The Word proves if it's of God. When is the church going to wake up and realize, first of all, not everybody that says they were sick and got healed was sick? And, and how, when's the church going to recognize that Satan can put on sickness and disease and take it off as well to give his false apostles greater acceptance in the body of Christ? That is not the criteria. The criteria is the Word of Almighty God. We must preach the Christ of the Bible. Then the Bible said they exposed them, branded them as evil. Therefore, I have to say it. Anyone who teaches that Jesus died spiritually is evil. They put them out. Because the sheep are more important than a preacher's reputation. The other two churches, Pergamos and Thyatira, not going to go into all the details of Jezebel and the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Well, I will on the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. That was unscriptural church government. It was the laity trying to control the pulpit. Don't happen. He controls. And the Lord rebuked both because they allowed them to preach their false doctrine and said nothing. Now how much clearer does it have to be? Don't write me any more emails. How clearer does it have to be? He commended one. He rebuked two others. He commended one. He rebuked two others. He didn't commend them because of you. He commended them because leadership said truth is more important than feelings. Now, is it right to practice biblical judgment? This is what everybody writes to me. Matthew 7, 1, judge not lest you be judged. We believe that. It is wrong to judge another brother. But what was Jesus talking about in Matthew 7, 1? Matthew 7, 1 means that as a believer, I cannot see your heart. Therefore, I do not know your motives. Therefore, I have no right to judge your heart or judge your motive. However, Jesus was not talking about doctrine in that passage. He was not speaking of rightly dividing the word of truth. He was talking about people putting a wrong spin on somebody's heart or a motive. I cannot see your heart. But by the same token, we are told in John chapter 7 verse 24 to judge righteous judgment. Which means this, as a minister of the gospel and you as a Christian, you have the right to judge every single word that comes out of my mouth. You judge it by the Word of God and you should judge it by the Word of God. It's not what I say. It's not what Dad 
said says. It's what the Word of God has to say. We judge righteous judgment. And then over here, I get over here. Where it says, Hebrews 5, 14, But strong meat belongeth to them that are full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. How do we do that? Because somebody stands up and preaches the Word of God under the power and the anointing, and it judges that which is not right. Now, we get down to the nitty gritty. What does the Bible say about exposing false doctrine? Or what are we to do in false doctrine? Number one, every false message and messenger, we are to try them. Revelation chapter 2. Next, we are to mark them and to avoid them. Romans chapter 16 and 17. That means some of you are going to have to go back and get rid of a lot of material in your house. We are to rebuke them. Titus 1.13 We are to have... Now listen to me. This is not me. This is the Word of God. We are to have no fellowship with false apostles preaching false doctrine. Ephesians 5.11 we are to withdraw from them. 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 and 15. 1 Timothy 6, 3 to 5. We are to turn away from them. 2 Timothy 3, 5 and 7. 2 Timothy 4 and 2. And this is the kicker. We are not to receive them into our house. Oh, but I'm never going to have Dr. So-and-so in my house. Yes, you do. When their television programs come on, their radio programs come on, their books and their TVs and the program and their tracts and their magazines, the Bible says we are not to receive them in our house because if they're wrong on the atonement, what else are they wrong on? What else are they wrong on? Then it says we are to reject them as heretics, Titus 3.10. And we are to stand and watch for those who preach another Jesus, another spirit, another gospel. 2 Corinthians 11.4, 2 Corinthians 11.13. And we are to separate from them, 2 Corinthians 6.17. But what about naming names? Paul rebuked Peter publicly. Galatians 2, 11 through 14, Paul named Demas for forsaking him. Paul named Hymenius and Alexander, 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. Paul named Hymenius and Philetus, 2 Timothy 2, 15 through 18. John named Diotrephes, an elder in the church, a pastor in the church, who became lifted up in pride. 3 John, verse 9. So I'm here to tell you tonight, we do have the biblical right to judge. We do have the biblical right to expose error. We do have the biblical right to stand up and say, Brother Copeland, I love you. I love you with all of my heart. I've known the man for 30 years nearly. My dad put him on radio. He sat in my dad's house and my dad told him how to put radio programs on there years ago. I love him, but I love him enough to tell him the truth that Jesus Christ did not go to hell as a sinner. I love Brother Hagin enough to say I am not the incarnation of Jesus Christ and I do not become a little Jesus. I am a poor fallen human being saved by the grace of God. But one day it's coming that I will receive my glorified body. And then I can be like Jesus. But where is the assemblies of God tonight? Where is the church of God in the four square? They should be standing up behind every pulpit holding up their word of God saying this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. Where is the Pentecostal evangel taking a stand on this? No, it's nowhere to be found. Where is it in the church of God magazine standing up saying Jesus Christ was not a demon possessed madman on the cross and for anybody to teach this is blasphemy. Where are the churches today standing up saying whether you like me or whether you hate me I will defend the Word of God and I will defend Jesus Christ today this date 140 years ago
today. Two great armies met and fought a bloody battle that would culminate in 50,000 dead, wounded, and missing. It took place in a little beautiful picturesque town, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. Lee had just won a major victory that threatened the entirety of the Union. The Union was hanging by a thread. And because Lee had the momentum, he said, we're going to invade the North. His goal, to take Washington, D.C. If I can take Washington, we'll win. We can sue for peace. And there will be no more United States, but each state will become an independent government of their own, which would have been doomed. Lincoln knew that if something didn't happen soon, that all was lost. He called his generals in and he said, meet them, find them, do not let them get to Washington. And that fateful morning when Union Cavalry spotters ran in to the first advance of Confederate forces and the battle begun, the Union forces were stretched out over several miles. They had a very advantageous position. The end of their troop line ended at a place called Big Round Top. Across from them was the Confederate forces arrayed across Seminary Ridge. What the Union did not know was that the Confederate forces extended about a mile and a half further past their lines. They couldn't see them correctly. They thought they were matched up equally. And by the, un the, by the Confederate forces being a mile and a half longer, they realized the back door was open for the Confederate forces to flank them and get behind them. General Meade and General Warren, on this day, in the early morning hours, rode their horses to the top of Big Round Top. They were confident, we've got the advantage, we can see further. But off into the distance, in a place where there should not have been troops, they heard a couple of musket shots. And Meade told Warren, go check that out. Warren was, had graduated second in his class at West Point in engineering. And was considered at that moment the premier engineer in all the Union Army. Topography was his specialty. His ride took him to a place called Little Round Top, a little ridge next to Big Round Top that was not fortified by the Union Army. He got there and he scanned the horizon and he couldn't see anything, but something in his spirit said, I don't feel right. And he sent a rider to the artillery, and he told them to turn their guns and to fire two salvos in an area that looked empty, off, far off in the distance, to the left of Little Round Top. No troops are there, that's what they thought. Two salvos fired and exploded. The sun was shining in the perfect way, and through his binoculars, all of a sudden, lo and behold, he began to see flashes of light as men jumped up, and he began to see rifles, barrels glinting off the sun. He began to see reflections of the sun off of sabers. 
And lo and behold, he saw thousands of troops beginning to stir. And he realized, we're exposed. We're naked. This is a perfect textbook flanking maneuver. Unbeknownst to him, at that moment, the orders had been given to Colonel Oakes of the 5th Alabama Regiment to take the 5th and the 10th Alabama and to do a flanking action and come behind the Union soldiers. Coming up through the coverage of hills and trees and boulders where there were no troops, use little round top to get behind the Union Army at big round top and cut them in two. They had already left. They were on the far left coming and beginning their infiltration. General Warren saw the danger. He grabbed the first rider he saw. He said, get me some troops. I don't care who they are. Get me some troops now. And he came across a colonel. His name was Colonel Strong Vincent. Born in Pennsylvania. He said, Colonel Vincent, General Warren says, get your men right now to Little Round Top. He immediately broke camp, got his men there. And the general explained to him, we've got no time. You're the only men we have. You must hold Little Round Top. They're going to flank us. And you are all that's standing between the Confederates and Washington, D.C. Undermanned, no water, no food. Broke camp that quick. He lined his men out, spread them out as much as he could. He no sooner got them in place than out of the thicket charged the 5th Alabama. Caught them almost by surprise. Screaming that bloodthirsty rebel yell, the Union men began to fall right and left. Vincent jumped down off his horse and imperious to the onslaught of bullets, ran into the front lines and began to pick men up, pick up your rifle, pick up your rifle, pick up your rifle. And began to march back and forth as bullets whipped up all around him. Hold the line! Hold the line! He began to tell the wounded, if you can hold a rifle, hold the line! And all of a sudden, two or three hours into the battle, the heat beating down, three attacks. They had repelled three more. His aide said, Colonel, we're going to have to pull back. we got too many wounded. I don't think we can hold the line. He said, we will not leave. We'll hold the line. And then his aide said, well, Colonel, if we're not going to leave, please get further behind the line. You're exposing yourself. Strong Vincent stood there and he said, Young man, I am Pennsylvania born. And if I die, it's a good place to die. But he looked at him and he said, Son, we're not here fighting for Pennsylvania. We're fighting for the Union. And the Union is more important than my life. And at that moment, the fourth charge hit. The Union began to be pushed back. And right at the moment when it looked like those rebel forces were going to have the momentum, here comes Strong Vincent again, saber in one hand, a pistol in the other. Rallying those troops till a mini ball cut him down. As he lay there dying, the last words he spoke out, he turned to his aide and grabbed him. He said, the Union is worth dying for. Hold the line. The cross is worth defending. The cross is worth dying for. The cross is worth the rebuke and the reproach. Stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. I want to read two texts tonight. I want you to go ahead and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 
But there is a preface text that the Holy Spirit has already spoken, but I had already planned to read it. Out of the great book of Isaiah chapter 1, the Holy Spirit through the prophet said, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Now, First Timothy chapter 4, reading verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, that's what the Holy Spirit was speaking of, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And I want to minister for a few minutes tonight on the subject, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Would you bow your heads? Father, we come before you tonight in the name of your son, Jesus. We thank you for the presence of the Lord that we have felt and experienced beginning last night. I stand tonight dependent 100% upon you. I know that the words that you have given me to share tonight will not make many happy, but I must deliver my heart. I must proclaim, thus saith the Lord. I ask for your anointing. Help me to say it exactly how you want it said. Go to the hearts of the people with this message. And Lord, we give you all the praise and glory. And everybody said, amen and amen. I had no idea this afternoon what Gabriel was going to be preaching on. I had no, de uh, no idea of the video clips that he would show. When I saw them, it was a mixture of great hurt and great anger at the same time. Great hurt knowing that young people are being led down a path of destruction, thinking they are heading on a path of righteousness. And then at the same time, a righteous anger rose up inside of me, an anger directed against the pastors and the youth pastors that would allow such vulgarity and such immor immorality and call it God. Let me tell you, I said it earlier, we've got too many tiny Tims standing behind the pulpit that don't stand for anything, that don't believe in anything, whatever goes, whatever can build a crowd, that's what they're for. But let me tell you, this church still believes in holiness and still believes in righteousness and still believes in lifting up the blood-stained banner of our Lord. I drove home. It, I, I don't know what, what happened. I think Everybody in Baton Rouge went crazy today and got on the roads. It took me almost 40 minutes to get home, and it's a 10-minute drive. But I was thinking, stuck in traffic, of my life being raised up. I'm 58 years old. This is all that I know, church, and I'm glad. And my mind went back. As a child traveling on the evangelistic field and the churches that we went to and 
the men of God that I had a privilege to sit under and to know, men like Bon Bowman that pastored Brightmoor Tabernacle in Detroit where I received the baptism in the Holy Spirit when I was 13 years old. Men like Carl Alcorn from Wichita Falls, Texas. Hansel Vibbert from Evansville, Indiana. H.C. Noah from Dallas, Texas. All of these were giants in the Lord. They've gone on to be with the Lord. If they were alive today, they would have had a coronary. I know what Brother Vibbert would have done if he would have been in that auditorium that we saw today. I, you had to know Brother Vibbert. He was a wild man. He didn't put up for any foolishness. If he would have been there, even if he wasn't in charge, he would have walked up on that platform, took the microphone out of their hands, and said, hit the road, Jack, and don't come back no more, no more, no more. Let, that's what we need. We need some men of integrity and men that know the word of God and men who love souls enough not to allow the foolishness of the world to come into the church and to feed it to our children and to our adults. I thank God for the way that I was raised. My parents would have never allowed me to go to something like that. And it grieved me and it, it broke my heart to see how far the church has fallen. I've been trying to tell dad because I am, I'm a studier of church, all the movements, the seeker sensitive, the emergent church, uh, the Hebraic movement. I've been trying to tell him how bad it is out there. The church and Dad said it last night, and I don't mean to be repetitive, but it has to be said. The church has never been in worse spiritual shape than it is right now. And the reason why the nation is so messed up is because the church is messed up. But at the same time, there are some good churches out there. You see, the world, the church is hung up on numbers. The whole thing is, it's not the message. It's just what can we do to put fannies in the seat? Yeah, you heard me right. It doesn't matter how stupid. They just had in the largest Pentecostal church in a Midwest city on a Sunday morning, I kid you not, the pastor walked up behind the pulpit, pulled out a can of beer, popped the top, and took a sip and said, there's nothing wrong with having a beer every once in a while. Ichabod. 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 Let me tell you, that church Somebody in that church should have stood up and said, it's time that you hit the road. You're fired. We don't want any sipping preacher behind the pulpit. We want somebody that's full of the Holy Spirit. Somebody that'll preach the word of God in power and anointing. Hallelujah. Now, we ain't nothing wrong with having a little drink. Yeah, you're going to have your little drink all the way to hell. But I want to encourage pastors out there that you may not have a large church, but you're still holding on to holiness and righteousness. You still believe in the cross. You still believe in the blood. Don't let the devil tell you that it's all about numbers. God is not interested in quantity. He's interested in quality. And I would rather see a church with 50 people that are on fire for God and full of the Holy Spirit and a preacher that still believes in the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation and will not back up from preaching the truth than a church of 5,000 that doesn't stand for anything.
That text I read in Isaiah, that was the church of that day. Now you've got to understand this. I always like to tell beginning ministers, if you want to know how God deals with the church, you must understand how God dealt with Israel. If you don't understand that, you cannot understand how God deals with the church because God has not changed. What was wrong for Israel 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 years ago is still wrong today. The Spirit said it first, then I read it. It said that the whole head is sick. Now, when you study that out, the idea of that statement is when you depart from the Word of God, when you depart from truth, you go insane. Spiritual insanity. You, you, you got to hear that. When you leave the Word of God and you go after the things of the world, you go after Baal, you go after Dagon, thinking they're Jehovah, you become spiritually insane. And that's what we have today. We've got a lot of insane preachers standing behind the pulpit because they've left the word of God. The heart is faint. That means no strength. Anything goes. I don't want to offend anybody. I can't speak against homosexuality because it might offend somebody. I can't say abortion is a sin because it might offend somebody. I can't say that living with a woman is all right because it might offend somebody. I'm amazed. Somebody called in Mother's Program the other day and said, I want to know if it's right if you got people in the praise team that are living with people and not married. Why would you have to ask a question like that? My Lord, where is the church? They are spiritually brain dead because they don't know the word of God. Spurgeon, C.H. Spurgeon, who is one of my heroes in the faith. Well over a hundred years ago, and let me just make this up for a second. Everything that's going on in the church world right now, it's not new. The devil has no new tricks. It's the same old lie. It's just put in a different box with different wrapping paper and a different ribbon, and the church opens it up and falls for it generation after generation after generation after generation. They talk about the seeker-sensitive church being a new movement. No, it's not. Spurgeon dealt with it in the 1880s as the Baptist Union of which he was a part in England. And I mean, Spurgeon was the crown prince of preachers. And the churches of the Baptist Union were saying, you can't have church the way you used to. The days of opening your Bible and reading it is passe. It will not hold the attention of the people. You're here, aren't you? I don't see you walking out. And so they quit preaching and they were actually hiring sinners that were stage actors of renown on the stages of England, plays, doing plays, doing plays. And they would hire them and bring them in on a Sunday morning to do dramatic readings. And then they would close out with a little scripture and a little word of encouragement. 
And Spurgeon said this. He said, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. Let me say that again. A time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. That time has come. We've got clowns behind the pulpit entertaining goats who wouldn't know the Lord, who wouldn't know the Holy Spirit if they came and sat down right beside him. Oh, I got to hurry. Paul, in 1 Timothy 4, he said, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly. Now, you gotta, we're going to exegete this verse. That is a $5 Greek word that means explain. <laughs> I just want to let you know I did go to Bible college. Because I got an email the other day that informed me of how dumb I was. <laughs> and that I was very ignorant because I did not believe in prayer shawls. And he informed me that there was another preacher whose name I will not call, that he was so much more learned than I was and educated. And if I would just listen to him, I would find out that the prayer shawls of Israel were the tents they lived in. That's an awful big shawl. There must have been some fat Hebrews running around. They must have been slipping off the side eating some barbecue pork. But Paul said, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. This is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. The term speaketh expressly means the Holy Spirit gave these words to Paul in a distinct in plain manner. In other words, uh, there was no unmistaking what the Holy Spirit was trying to say. In Revelations chapters 2 and 3, seven times, the Holy Spirit would say, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Seven times. That word ear, hear there, it doesn't mean just hearing and mental assent. It means hearing and acting upon it, taking it to the heart and obeying what the Holy Spirit is saying. I want you to know today, the Holy Spirit is not silent. He is still speaking. He is still speaking to the hearts of men and women, and he's still speaking to the church, and I can say it right now on the authority of the word, now the Spirit speaketh expressly. That in the latter times, this refers to the close of what the Spirit said, the church age, the dispensation of grace. And before the millennial reign of Christ, actually it's speaking of the time that we're now living in. This is the last days. We are seeing the Laodicean church, not on the outside, but it's mixed up on the inside. The apostate church. You've got two churches running parallel, the Philadelphia church, which is the missionary church, and you've got the Laodicean church, the apostate church, that says we are rich and increased in goods and then have need of nothing. We've got a Starbucks in the lobby. You, no, never mind, I'm not gonna say it. That word ladder, in the Greek means afterward, at the last of all. The idea is that what I read in Isaiah, what I read in 1 Timothy, the problems, they've always existed in the church, but there is coming a time which we're now living in that these problems will become more greater and greater and greater and greatly exacerbated until they're not just in a few churches, but they have infiltrated almost all of the church. 
And it said, some shall depart from the faith. Now listen, some shall depart from the faith. This refers to a departure from the word of God. But more particularly, it refers to a departure from the major theme of the Bible, which is Jesus Christ and him crucified. The theme of the Bible is not angels. The theme of the Bible is not demon spirits. The theme of the Bible is not miracles. The theme of the Bible is man was born a sinner and could not save himself, but God sent his son born of a virgin 2,000 years ago, and he died on Calvary's cross and shed his sinless perfect body as a perfect sacrifice, as the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the the world now 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 see now they, they're attacking us well you're just making too much of the cross we need to go beyond the cross where do you go how do you go beyond life no you didn't hear me how do you go beyond life if you leave the cross the only thing that is left is death God called this day. Now I don't talk about the resurrection. I said, did you not hear my sermon two weeks ago when I preached on the four resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ? And I said, but sir, it wasn't the incarnation that saved you. It wasn't the miracles of the Lord that saved you. And I said, thirdly, the resurrection of Jesus Christ was never in doubt. He was coming out of that tomb. He was coming out of that tomb because there was no sin in him. Therefore, Satan could not hold him. Three days I will be in the belly of the earth, but I'm coming back victorious over death, hell, and the grave. The resurrection ratified what Jesus did at Calvary 2,000 years ago. But there wouldn't have been a resurrection if there hadn't have been a crucifixion. Some should depart from the faith. Today, doctrine is laughed at, dismissed, lampooned. But without true biblical doctrine, the church is blind where there is an absence of true biblical doctrine satan will always see to it that false doctrine fills the void now did you hear that where there is an absence of true biblical doctrine satan will always fill the void with that which is false the message of the cross is being openly attacked and dismissed, and I know what I'm talking about. But understand this tonight, the cross is the dividing line between the true church and the apostate church. The cross is the dividing line. A line has been drawn in the sand. I remember as a child standing at the Alamo in San Antonio, and I love history, and I'm a romantic at heart. And I stood out there, little boy, and I, and I put myself inside of the Alamo with the Mexican army on the outside. Ten to one, no way you're going to make it. But then they take that sword and they draw that line in the sand, Whoever wants to stay and defend, step across this line. And all 182 of them stepped across that line. Davy Crockett was too sick, as in a sick bed. He said, pick the bed up and bring me, I mean, Daniel, uh, James, James Bowie. He was in a sick bed, and they had to carry him across. And he said, if I can't stand on a wall, put my knife in one hand and a pistol in the other. That's what we need today. Draw a line drawn in the sand that says I got the Bible in this hand and I'm holding on to the cross with this hand.
Now listen. If you reject the message of the cross, you will be lost. If you reject the cross as the only means of salvation, justification, and sanctification, you will be lost. It's not the cross plus. It's not the cross plus the assemblies of God. It's not the cross plus water baptism. It's not the cross plus membership. It's not the cross plus giving an offering. It's the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross only the cross. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Gabriel said it today, but the Lord had already given it to me, but I'm going to repeat it. Joshua 24, 15 still says, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But, 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 but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Family Worship Center, we will serve the Lord. If everybody walks out, if everybody turns their back, we will serve the Lord. You can ask Gabriel as a teenager, Driving, I'd walk up to him, so I'd say, give me your keys. What for? Just give me your keys. Walk out there, turn that engine on, turn the radio on. See where the presets were. <laughs> See what CDs. Now, I got, I got to say this about Gabriel was so sweet. <laughs> the worst, let me tell you how sweet Gabriel is. Something happened. I didn't know if it was Matthew or Gabriel. I couldn't figure out which one had done it. But for some reason, I just thought Gabriel did it. I came there, I thought, Gabriel, you did it. And finally, he goes, I did it, I'm sorry. And I spanked him. Then I found out later he didn't do it. <laughs> I said, Gabriel, why did you confess to something you didn't do? I just felt like I needed to. I could never spank him after that. Good psychology there. But if there was something that was not uplifting, he'll tell you. I'd walk in with that CD and go click, and break it out that said, son, that's my car. That's my gas. That's my insurance. And as long as you're in my car, you're not gonna listen to that which worships the devil or glorifies the devil. <laughs> Giving heed to seducing spirit, this tells us the cause of the church's departure from truth. Seducing in the Greek is planos, that's the word. It means wandering. That's what the church is doing, it's wandering. It means roving, it means misleading. We've got preachers misleading the laity. It means leading into error. Spirits refer to evil spirits actually putting into motion human agents to do their bidding. In other words, preachers become deceived by seducing spirits and are placed in places of prominence to spew their lie. And they come forth as an angel of light. These spirits so blind the church that the truth becomes a lie and a lie becomes the truth because the church is deceived. These spirits bring the world into, let me tell you, when I was growing up in church, 
There was a line. The world was out there and the church was in here. But now the church is not all, I mean the world is not only in the church, the world is on the pulpit on the platform, standing behind the pulpit. Let me tell you, you go into some churches and the preacher walks out on Sunday morning with a shirt that's wrinkled, rumpled up, pulled out, blue jeans with holes in the knees, no socks, and are already a pair of tennis shoes looking like they've been partying all night and the praise and worship singers, the girls have got two tops on showing their belt. Let me tell you, the church has gone insane. I was... I was preaching in South Africa the last time I was there. Got to this church I'd never preached there before. And they were waiting, the deacon board was waiting for me because the pastor had had an emergency. A member of his family had had a heart attack and he had to leave. And they were letting me know. And and I said, well, let's, let's pray for that individual. And we had prayer outside the church. Then I walked in. And I was shocked. The church, it was pitch black. The walls were painted completely black. The ceiling was painted completely black. The only light was at that, that was on was a spotlight on the stage. And then the praise, what they called praise and worship team came out. And it was the loudest chaotic noise. And I'm supposed to preach. Now, I'm sitting there. I'm not dumb. I know if the pastor's not there, I can do whatever I want to do because I'm leaving after the service. <laughs> so when I walked up, they had told me, said, we'll, we'll stay up, praise the worship, we'll stay up behind you. And I got up, I said, thank you, you can go sit down. Then I said, I want every light in the building turned on. Amen. And nothing happened. I stood there, I said, I said, I want every light in the church turned on. Nothing happened. I said, this is the last time I'm saying it. If the lights are not on in 30 seconds, I'm leaving. And all of a sudden the lights come, came on and it had been got so long since they had all the lights on, half the people were going. And I very nicely said, this is not a show. This is church. And we don't worship in the dark like the pagans worship their false gods. We worship the true God in the light of his glory and his holiness and his beauty. Oh, I got to hurry. Doctrines of devils. Actually, this phrase should have been translated doctrines of demons for there is only one devil. But there are many demons who are his servants do his biddings. It's important to note that Paul finds the source of false doctrine in these demon spirits who entice God's children away from the truth. Now listen, never forget that whatever's being preached from behind the pulpit, if it's truth, it's backed by the Holy Spirit. If it's a lie, it's backed by demon spirits. Now, you got to understand that. There is a spirit behind every message that is preached. Mother told me, I got singers, musicians, you can slowly make your way back. I, I want to show you the insanity that the church has found itself in. There's an old saying that a picture's worth a thousand words. When I first heard about this, mother told me about it, I thought she was joking. She said, Donnie, have you heard about this fad that is sweeping the churches called the Harlem Shake? I said, what are you talking about? She said, no, I've never heard of it. That day I went, I, I, now I'm a studier. If you tell me something's out there, I'm gonna go try to find it. And so I started researching what is the Harlem Shake. And I, I found, I mean, there was the story of the guy who wrote it. 
It was so filthy. The language that he was using, so filthy. About every third word was the F word. About every fifth or sixth word was the Lord's name taken in vain until I finally couldn't read the rest of the article. It was filthy. You wanted to go take a shower afterwards. And I came and I said, they're doing this in churches? And she said, yes. And I didn't believe her. But mother's right. And you saw some, some of you saw it on Francis and Friends. And I've pulled just a few so that you can see how far the church has sunk. This first clip is from Saddleback Church, pastored by Rick Warren, who is supposed to be the nation's pastor. No offense, but I would rather have a janitor that knows God as my pastor. This was in a youth service sponsored and sanctioned by him and by his leadership. I want you to look at the monitors. And Randy, I want you to play that first clip. Now, the words in that are Spanish, and this is what they mean. We are with the terrorist. That's what the words to that song mean. We are with the terrorist. In other words, we're with the ones that killed nearly 4,000 Americans on 9-11. God help us. The church has gone insane. And listen. This is the man that the leaders of the Assemblies of God and the Church of God and the Four Square are following. Listen, you can get mad if you want to, but if you follow that, you're following it straight into hell because that is not of God. That is of the devil. That is demonic. That is hellish. That is from the pit of hell. I'm ashamed to say that I was raised assembly of God. The assemblies of God that I was raised in would vomit over that. I was raised in an assembly of God that still believed in the Bible, that still believed in the power of the Holy Ghost, that still believed in sinners being saved and bondages broken, but they sold it all out for the Harlem Shake. They sold it out for 30 pieces of silver. <laughs> Judas! This second clip is even worse. It's from a church in Australia. It is complete filth and blasphemy because it pictures Christ on the cross. Now watch this. Con los terroristas. <laughs> How dare anybody mock the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did at Calvary's cross. Go ahead, Randy, with clip number three. Oh, 
Now what that African American, it was not a woman, that was a man dressed as a woman. Now what he was doing against that youth pastor, I'm gonna, it's vulgar, but I'm gonna say it because this is what it's called in the streets, dry humping. That's what they call it. That's what they do in the nightclubs and they brought it into the church. That was from a church here in this city. No, that was from a hellhole in this city. I'm not even going to show the last one. I, I, I'm fed up. I'm sick to my stomach. I don't know. Listen, as I close, I don't blame the young people. I do not blame those young people. I blame the youth pastors and the pastors. I hold them responsible. Now here is the problem. Some of those young people on those videos that you saw are going to die and go to hell because of the lies and the garbage their youth pastors and pastors have fed them. You better mark my word. They're going to hell. Ungodly leadership. We need some Jeremiah's. We need some Abraham's. We need some Daniel's. We need some Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's. We need some Deborah's. We need some Hannah's. We need some JL's who will take a spike and nail it through the temple of the enemy of God and win a victory. Hallelujah. We need some men and women with backbone, whether they're a pastor or whether they're laity, that will stand up and say, we're not putting up with this garbage anymore. Preach the word or get out of the pulpit. Now, I got to close. Everything I've said has been negative, but I'm not closing on a negative note. I'm closing on a positive note because in spite of the sin and the degradation and the rebellion of the church, there is still a remnant. There's still 7,000 out there who hasn't bowed the knee to Baal. There's still some Daniels out there that won't stop praying. There's still some Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's that will walk into a fiery furnace and say, oh king, we may burn, but we will not bow. There's still some Peter and John's that will say silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And furthermore, every one of you that are a part of SBN, you are that remnant. You are a part of that remnant. And I got news for the devil. The church is not going down to the Harlem Shake because my Bible says that God is coming back for a church without spot without wrinkle, wash in the blood of the lamb. Wash in the blood, wash in the blood, wash in the blood, wash in the blood of the lamb. And here's what the Lord told me to, how to end it. If my people, which are called by my name, and that name is not Buddha. That name is not Muhammad. That name is not Allah. That name is not Joseph Smith. That name is not Donnie Swagger. That name is Jesus Christ. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray 
and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. Then will I forgive their sin. And then will I heal their land. Here is the word of the Lord. For this Thursday night, 2013, there is still a bomb in Gilead. There is still a great physician. There is still a God that can prepare a table in the wilderness. There's still a God that's gonna pour out his spirit in these last days. Don't care what Washington does. Don't care what Springfield does. Don't care what Cleveland does. Don't care what LA does. Don't care what St. Louis does. I just care what heaven does. And heaven is about ready to be poured out. For in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Now, if you believe that, if you believe that tonight, revival, for revival to start in the world, it has to start in you. You want revival in the church, it's gotta start in you. I don't know what they're gonna sing, but whatever they're gonna sing, these altars are open. And we're coming around and we're gonna believe God. Now listen, listen, listen. You gotta make a decision. You either gotta choose the Harlem Shake or you gotta choose the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And I choose the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. If you want revival, if you want to see our nation stirred, if you want to see our young people saved and our pulpits brought back to holiness and righteousness, let's fill this front right now. Come on. It was amazing. Come on. Sin grace. How sweet the sound that saved. something I do not know tonight in this service how many pastors are here but if you're a pastor the Lord told me for you to get out of your seat and make your way to this front and we're gonna pray that you're gonna have an anointing of the Holy Spirit like you've never had before you're gonna have an unction and a power to preach you're gonna have an anointing of the Holy Spirit flowing through you Oh, you're going to see souls saved. You're going to see sick bodies healed. You're going to see believers baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're going to see demon powers broken. You're going to see bondages broken. Right now, if you're a pastor, lift your hands. And those of you that see them, now start laying hands on them right now. Those of you around them, start laying hands. Come on, Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask right now for the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon these ministers of the gospel that they would preach your word as never before. Mandala 
of debt in our nation we have a president who doesn't know up from down and a congress and a senate that's worse we have no leadership in this nation because we have no leadership in the church now you hear what I'm saying God has raised up SBN and he has given us and is giving us an even greater a platform of leadership it's going to cause demons to come out of the woodwork but that's all right david is still killing giants i said david is still killing giants and here's when you go back to your churches the devil's going to hit you. This is what I'm going to leave with you. It's not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Now give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Oh, well, kneel at the 